Hey, it's Father Rob, and welcome back to Read, Mark, Learn, and Inwardly Digest. This is our reading of the Gospel of Mark for the Good Book Club that's going all the way through February 17th on Ash Wednesday. I hope you are keeping up your practice. Let's begin our reflection of chapters 6 and 7 with our prayer from page 236 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I hope you're praying that prayer or some similar prayer each day as you sit down and spend a little time with the Gospel of Mark. And over the last week, we have looked at chapters 6 and 7. And right there in chapter 6, we run across, once again, something we talked about last week, which is another Markin sandwich. Yes, Mark has made us another tasty little po'boy that starts with him sending out some of his disciples on mission, which they do indeed go out and do. And then all of a sudden, we get a flashback where Jesus doesn't appear at all, and we hear the story of the death of John the Baptist at the hands of King Herod. Then we come back and we see the disciples return from their mission. And note that they're called not just disciples now, but apostles. So what's the difference between disciples and apostles? Disciples are students. We are followers of Jesus. We are students of Jesus. And then when we are sent out on mission, we really kind of become apostles. I know that sounds crazy, but that's really all apostle means is sent one, one who is sent out on mission. So the disciples become apostles when they are sent out on mission. And every week when we say the Nicene Creed together, or if you say the Apostles' Creed, you actually say this when you talk about one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. This doesn't just mean a church organized with bishops in apostolic succession and all that stuff. It also means we're a church of people who are sent. The bishop then becomes the primary representative of that sentness, but you and I are also part of that apostolic mission. We are sent out, we are sent ones, sent on mission by Jesus, just like the first apostles were. In chapter six, we also get a little bit of what my old New Testament professor Chris Bryan called a joke because Herod is called king. Even the people of that time would not have called Herod King Herod unless they really were making a joke, which Mark is. The Romans never would have allowed Herod to be king. He was what was known as a tetrarch, and he was under the control and authority of a Roman governor. He acted as an agent on behalf of the state of Rome. He was not a king. For Mark to call Herod king really is kind of a dig, kind of an inside joke. Mark's trying to make a contrast here. We've been talking about Jesus spreading the kingdom of God. Jesus is the real king. Right around the time we get this story of King Herod and his execution of John the Baptist, we also hear the story of the feeding of the 5,000. We also get the story of Jesus walking on water. Remember what water is? It's a symbol of chaos in the ancient world. Jesus is the one who walks over chaos and brings order to it. This is what a good king does. He provides for his people. He brings order out of chaos. Herod is the joke king. Jesus is the real king, ushering in the kingdom of God. In this section, we get some more healing, we get some more controversies with the Jewish leaders, and we even get an indication of who the Gospel of Mark is intended for. At the beginning of chapter 7, Mark does some explaining about Jewish ritual practices, which means that Mark's primary audience may not have been Jewish. It may have been at least made up of enough Gentiles that they would have needed some explanation of what was going on here. In chapter 7, verse 18, we get another indication that the disciples aren't so bright. They don't get Jesus' teaching. So there's that characteristic again of Jesus being the savior of flawed humanity and calling flawed people as disciples. And at the end of chapter 7, we get the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman where he calls her a dog. This seems really harsh coming from Jesus, doesn't it? Here's the really wonderful thing about this story. 
Jesus appears to learn from the interaction with the woman. Now, sometimes commentators on this passage will try to make excuses for Jesus and say, well, he's really just testing her. Why does it need to be that way if we believe that Jesus was both fully divine and fully human? Let's let him be fully human. He has an interaction with this woman where he sees her as one of those Gentiles, not a Jewish person like himself and all of his disciples. Why in the world should he help her? She answers him in a very clever way and it gets his attention. That's the thing about being both human and divine. We can make room for Jesus to make some mistakes and grow. What's divine is his ability to immediately recognize where he's messed up and correct it. Jesus seems to learn in this passage that his mission is bigger than even he realized. It's not just for his Jewish brothers and sisters, it's for the whole world. It's for even Gentiles. I'm still reading this gospel with my son and this week what really stuck out to him was that Jesus and the disciples didn't even have time to eat as it says in chapter 6 verse 31. So many people are following Jesus. So many people are crowding around him and seeking something from him. Mark's trying to help us recognize that Jesus offers us the things that we truly need. He offers nourishment and health and meaning. He offers real leadership. He offers partnership in mission with other people, even people who are outside of his normal circle. He's creating a diverse and loving community. If you want to look into the Gospel of Mark a little bit more, I encourage you to go to goodbookclub.org for more resources around the Good Book Club study that we are all doing together. And I hope you are enjoying this practice. Keep it up.